I have massively renovated my eBay business model in the past couple months, and I'm also determined to employ a new level of radical candor on this channel going forward. So let me tell you honestly, my eBay business over the past five years has been kind of blah, and I was being very stubborn about it. I had this idea of what was going to work and what I liked, and I was sticking to it. I'll tell you what those ideas were, and then I'll talk about why I was so stuck on them, and then I'll tell you what I'm doing now instead, and spoiler alert, it's working better. My business model on eBay for the past five years. As you may know, if you've watched my channel before, my reselling niche of preference was ephemera. And what you may not know, since I never was very specific about it, is that my business model was basically buy ephemera in bulk from auctions, estate sales, markets, and wherever else I could find it in quantity, maintain a huge inventory of over 10,000 items, so there was a chance that some of these obscure things would be found by the one person who wanted them, use my knowledge of decorative arts, graphic design, history, and material culture history to know when I had something interesting and how to keyword it well, price high to drive up perceived value and thus actual value of said items, and mostly ignore the numbers or <laughs> be in denial for long stretches of time, and use a mix of hope and obdurateness in lieu of being analytical. This led to eBay sales that were, as I mentioned, blah. Luckily, I was doing other things too. I had a couple boon years selling on Amazon FBA during the pandemic, and there were also the other selling platforms and my design business and my Keep Salem Odd store. But I put a lot of work into eBay and clearly liked it, but I was disappointed that it didn't do better. Even when I won an up and coming grant from eBay and spent several months working one on one with a really great growth advisor from the eBay team, there was something that dust wasn't working and I was not seeing. And she didn't see it either, as she wasn't an expert on ephemera and being rather stuck into what I was doing, I think I convinced her that my business model was good. <laughs> we looked at a lot of numbers together, mostly metrics about click-through rates and keywords and views, and sure enough, I did get a really good number of eyeballs on my items for what they were versus other items like them. My growth advisor was impressed, but somehow this didn't translate beyond a rather paltry part-time sort of income, unless if you consider just how much illiquid money was tied up in the longest of long tail items living in my closet. Two asides. I did learn a lot of cool stuff about eBay working with my growth advisor, and it's now up to me to apply it better and to relay that info to you too. Also, if you are an ephemera fan, don't panic. I'm not going to stop making videos about that stuff altogether as I am also a fan and my closet is still rather full. Why did I stay in this relationship with my bad business model for so long? You have to understand that while I've been entrepreneurial since I was a little kid, I was always driven by the process or the art of what I was doing rather than having a visceral correlation in my mind between creating a business that I liked and earning money. Even when my best friend and I, aged about seven, started a store in her dining room called Hearts and Things, where we peddled bookmarks that we'd made by drawing on cut up envelopes, I knew the only reason we were successful making a whopping 25 cents or something was because we had a captive customer base in her parents and they had really no choice but to buy. I had this really crappy idea that if you were doing something you liked, it wasn't a viable job. 
My response to this, in some but not all cases, was to go into severe denial mode about numbers when working on some of my favorite projects. Not useful for making a business profitable, to be sure, but like I said, I was driven more by the art and the process than the money and the realities. I'd just do some more jobs to make ends meet. Where did this baloney come from? Some art teacher in my youth, attempting to encourage practice and discipline, told me that Picasso could have only become a cubist because he'd first proved his mettle as a realist. And Picasso is kind of an asshole. But it stuck in my mind. Indeed, I was raised with this belief that you have to pay your dues. You have to earn your cred by doing things the hard way, by suffering and playing by the rules, preferably kissing up gratefully to the corporate hierarchy and suffering extensively and wearing uncomfortable high-heeled shoes and pantyhose <laughs> all along the way. And if you didn't suffer, I mean work hard enough and sycophantically enough, you might not ever get ahead. And even if you do get ahead, there will be just a whole new level of unpleasant hard labor and more advanced sycophancy to endure. Even if you made it to the top and were the boss, there'd be customers or shareholders' asses to kiss, and certainly you'd be living a life of painful toil. Work sucks, and then you die. Unsurprisingly, having this attitude instilled in me did not serve me well. Hello, limiting beliefs, insecurities, and imposter syndrome. It's a bit of a vicious cycle, too. If you think you don't deserve to have cred or success because you haven't paid your dues or worked hard enough, it's hard to break away and realize that this is not a productive way to think. Even if these ideas had been useful when my parents and teachers were being raised in the 50s and early 60s, they certainly are not true now. It is irrelevant in today's landscape of internet disintermediation. Education, opportunities, and livelihoods have been turned on their heads. The 21st century creative and knowledge economy has little to do with the industrial economy of the 20th century. It's a comparative land of milk and honey today. I must here take a step back and say that there are valid historical, geographical, and systemic reasons why not everyone has the same access to these modern marvels. And I am by no means trying to deny that, but I'm talking in generalizations here. Point being that even though I eventually broke through these life lessons from my childhood about paying your dues, point being that even though I eventually broke through these life lessons from my childhood about paying your dues, and it did take longer than one might like, I've still held on to some limited beliefs about self-imposed stick-to-itness that I've unwittingly held myself back with. The phrase self-sabotaging entrepreneur comes to mind here, as if there's a visible tag cloud floating above my head that says it. So if you needn't be beholden to the man and the rules, then what? I have a book from when I was a full-time graphic designer. It's called Making and Breaking the Grid. It's about knowing the rules for laying out a page, then deciding whether or not you should do it that way. Know the rules so you can break them. I think that's more like the right level of paying your dues these days. Glance through a picture-filled art book that gives you an overview of what the so-called rules are, how traditional business is done, Clean what you can from that. Then go ahead and break the rules and do what works. And don't be afraid to keep changing what that is. Constant, agile adaptation is the new pension plan. I'm not suggesting that you live, or more pointedly, run your business anarchically. When I said in that video the other day that there are no rules, what I meant was that you get to postulate what rules will work for you, test them, modify as needed, and then choose the degree to which you live by or break them going forward. Then you get to switch it up and try new rules as you get smarter or need stimulation or need to pivot. You can grab inspiration from anywhere. You can switch mentors if the ones you've been listening to aren't helping you get where you want to go. What's right for them might not be right for you. 
You don't even have to listen to me if this sounds mad. This is what I finally internalized after far too long. This is what helped me to change up my eBay business model, and hopefully it will spread positively to other aspects of my work and life too. Getting concrete, what am I now doing on eBay? Let me tell you what I've let go of and what I've added. Let go. All of a sudden it clicked. People are searching for and finding my ephemera in similar listings, but they're not buying. I have good pictures most of the time and good keywords and interesting items. So what the hell? Oh, it's the price that valuing things really high to influence the market thing. No, people don't want to pay a lot for little bits of old ratty paper and plastic and metal and leather and fabric. For a few select spectacular items, true rarities and important artifacts, sure. But for most of it, the stuff that's truly ephemeral that should have been put in the garbage a hundred years ago, that should not be priced so high. So I put almost all of my ephemera on sale, mostly at 50% off, some a little less, some even more. And guess what? It started selling. <laughs> Do I feel like past me was a big dummy? Yes. Do I feel like present me is super smart? Also yes. And you know how they say fail faster in startup circles? Yeah, that. Most of my extant ephemera is going to stay on sale pretty much all of the time. I'm liquidating the old. I'm not saying I won't still pick things up, but I will have a very different pricing strategy. I want it to move fast for a profit, but fast. The smaller profit is better than a closet full of bits of hundred year old paper crumbling to dust. Adding. Here's revelation number two, and please pardon me because it's kind of appallingly obvious. I should sell things that are in demand. I know, I know. I'm sure it has been mentioned before to me. I'm sure I've told it to myself a hundred times before, but somehow I wasn't interpreting what it meant correctly. I was off down some rabbit holes about importing pu'er tea from China and private labeling God knows what. I was telling myself that because I don't know jack shit about video games or Funko Pops or basketball sneakers, I couldn't sell popular things. But hello, I was a little confused. Those are trendy things. There is a demand for trendy things, but there is also a demand for a lot of other things, utilitarian things, everyday things, used mass produced consumer products for which the supply and accessibility is not keeping up with the demand. And there's a way to find out what those things are. It's called eBay, the world's largest online marketplace. Well, after Amazon and possibly Alibaba. So that's what I've been up to the past couple months. I'm studying what products sell by looking at sell through rates. I'm looking at what products sell profitably by comparing sold comps with my cost of goods that I can source items at. I know, freaking obvious, but it was a huge mind shift shift for me. Again, I feel a little slow for not getting on this train before, but woohoo, all aboard. <laughs> so this is the new plan so far. Ephemera is a volume game. Keep it cheap and moving as fast as possible. Make juicy lots, giving buyers big value for their money. Add as many high sell through rate, good to high profit items into the store as possible. Use promoted listings from time to time judiciously. Keep an eagle eye on as many relevant metrics as possible and act on their advice. I'll talk more about all of these action items in detail in upcoming videos. Um, you'll also see in my what sold type videos that there are different kinds of things that I'm selling and you'll see the changes in action in my store. I'm already seeing vast improvements in my gross revenues and the sheer number of packages that I am shipping out. Now. Far be it for me, 
cynical, grouchy Gen Xer to say it, but I'm actually feeling pretty optimistic. (laughs) 